um, as I'm presenting today. Thank you. Google We'll begin in just a few minutes. It's just noon now, just in case people are um, still coming on in. So, but in the chat box, if you could just share your learning management system that you'll be using this fall, that would be great. Thank you. I'll be the school of Please. What do you think? Should we go for it? Yeah. Okay. I guess it's 12.01. As Kathy Werzer would say, it's 12.01. The presentation is next, right? Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gina Osmus, and I am going to be presenting best practices and practical tips in virtual spaces. Uh, I am a life science teacher at Pine City High School, and I have a moderator here with me, and I will pause every so often for pressing questions, but my goal was try to try to leave time at the end of our time together to answer any questions that you have from the presentation. Okay, so I want to begin with a story. Once upon a time, there was a life science teacher who loved connecting with her students, along with all of the other duties and responsibilities of a teacher prior to COVID-19. One fine day, this teacher made a new discovery about a very shy student. The teacher observed the methodical approach of the student completing his, his assignments and putting all of his supplies away. The teacher complimented the student on their effort and attention to, de to detail and remarked how she was reminded of herself and her obsessive compulsive disorder ways. The student sat silent for a moment, looked the teacher in the eye for the very first time and smiled because his family had also commented on his OCD too. Huzzah, a connection was made and a bond was forged or was it? Fast forward to spring of 2020, dun, 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 and distance learning. The shy student with attention to detail fell off the radar. No amount of emails, phone messages, or letters accompanying the delivery of non-digital materials could reach this student. The missing assignments list grew along with the silence, but the teacher thought she was doing all the right things. She was po posting super detailed announcements twice a week along with the checklist so the story does not end with the student failing. So you can just 
rest assured. But on the 11th hour of the last day of the last quarter, an email was received from the student's father asking if his son could still submit assignments. Yes, 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 for the love of all that is holy, yes. Bing, 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 bing. The teacher's inbox fills with notifications of completed assignments. The student did pass, but what did they learn and retain? The world may never know, or we'll find out when they take their eighth grade MCA science test in 2021. So my hope is that you will learn from my mistakes and missteps and walk away from today's presentation with at least one helpful tip on how to create similar brick and mortar relationships and collaboration with students in virtual spaces. So um, first of all, please keep these practical tips in mind with every best practice that I share with you. Okay, so there are a few of them. First one is keep it simple. We crave simplicity. Songs are written about it along with magazines and books to make our lives simpler. So why would online teaching and learning be any different? So please keep it simple. Be consistent. That is consistency with your due dates, when you post assignments, when you put announcements into your LMS, when you release new material, when you return your emails to students, when you grade things and update your grade book, feedback that you give, create a consistent pattern or plan from the beginning to eliminate any unnecessary confusion, not only for the students, but also for their parents. And next, be you. No one is perfect. Allow students to see you make a mistake and then correct it because that will encourage a connection, believe it or not, and build a relationship with that student. And you are showing them that you have a growth mindset when you model those behaviors. So without further ado, I do have some best practices to share with you for virtual spaces. How are we doing on questions? Anything yet? Awesome. Okay, so here we go. Your organization of your learning management system. So it looks like we have a majority of Google Classroom people, a few, uh, a Schoology, Moodle, and Seesaw. Unfortunately, I've only been on the um, receiver end of Moodle. I've never worked with Seesaw. So, um, but I think a lot of these tips can still, or best practices, excuse me, can still apply to you. Um, the things that I'm going to be looking at are a welcome, a biography, an overview of your course, and then how you place your assignments within it. So we're going to touch upon each of these. A recommended best practice is to email your students one to two weeks prior to class beginning, believe it or not. So you can include the code to join your learning management system and encourage them to look around and become familiar with you and the class. Most students may not join, but a few might, and you could begin connecting with them at that very moment. Another recommendation is to include how you will provide access to students with special needs and how your class is a safe zone for all students in your welcome message. A biography. Um, you probably do this when you start your class out at the beginning of the school year, but you want to make sure to include information about you to personalize it, to let them know you have a life outside of school. Um, also, if you, we are not actually in the classroom with these kiddos, adding visuals, so pictures, and also how you use your punctuation, all of these things convey your enthusiasm. So don't be afraid to do that and uh, connect with those students. Course overview. This one can really look a couple different ways, but it really does boil down in your, what you include in your course is the expectations of you as their teacher, expectations of them as your student, and expectations of each other or the classmates. So, what will students expect from you? You should have an area in your learning management system for students to post questions. This is a best practice shared with me. Um, 
for instance, and I can show this to you later in my Google Classroom, I've just gone ahead and put student questions and it's linked to a Padlet. Um, and they know in my um, that I will tell them that my goal is to respond to them within 24 hours, which depending on which age group of students you work with, 24 hours may seem like a very long time to them, but you also have to set up boundaries very early on in your course. Also let them know when you will be posting new assignments and when those assignments are due. And remember my tip of being consistent. Just make sure that you are always maybe posting, releasing new information on the same day and having things due on a, a very consistent day as well. That helps them prioritize and build study skills. So we want to encourage that. Also let them know when grades will be updated um, and share that information with them. Assignments. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a little ahead of myself. Um, what they need to expect of what we expect of them. So not only are we posting our learning objectives, and that should be within the classroom, um, but we also, a, a, another best practice is to give them a to-do list or a checklist um, with the assignments and the due date. Provide all links and estimates of time to complete is another best practice. And I will show you an example of how this could look if you chose to use it, but this would be something that um, as long as you have that consistent flow and pattern you could have for your students. Another recommendation is to look at the ISTE standards for students. That's another thing. Um, there's these technology standards out there that students, um, as you plan your lessons, you can incorporate for students to achieve um, with their lessons. And what to expect from each other um, classmates. So we want them to be collaborating and cooperating with, with each other, not only in the classroom, but in an online spaces. These are skills that are um, 21st century learning skills as well. And we would stress netiquette with them. A lot of students may not be familiar with netiquette, and I'll talk about that later in my presentation. Okay, assignments. I kind of alluded to this one and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it. So um, teaching requires your presence most days of the week and online is no different. You cannot put the information in your learning management system and walk away. It's not a crock pot. Many learning management systems have a linear flow design similar to social media sites that students are familiar with. So this is actually a feat, uh, benefit to most of us. And Google Classroom, as you probably know, the most recent thing that you post is always going to be on the top, so they'd have to look back to find it. Same with Schoology, it's going to um, post the top. You can rearrange those. Um, Moodle, from what I understand, it's the same kind of a, a setup. Um, I, like I said, I can't speak to Seesaw, but it seems like most learning management systems, Blackboard, D2L, they all, Canvas, they all have that linear flow, which is a benefit um, since so many social media sites have that. Um, HyperDocs. I'm curious to know how many of you are familiar with HyperDocs. I was introduced to HyperDocs this summer. I had taken a class on um, online teaching and uh, basically, HyperDocs are like a Google Doc on steroids. They embed active learning strategies, collaboration, and reflection all in one place for students. And I have a link here to a HyperDoc that I can share with you. Um, and I have more information at the end of my presentation if you want to investigate HyperDocs a little bit more. But I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of back out and click on this link so I can share my this with you. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So give me a second. I'm going to stop and then do just a window. Doo -doo -doo. And Um, OK. 
cancel. I'll get this. If it's not, we're going to just do the whole screen and just click okay. the window you want. Perfect. I will do that. My apologies. Do, do, do. Okay. Share. Okay. So uh, one of the first units that we'll have in science, I teach seventh grade science primarily, um, is the scientific explanations unit. And so this is a Google Doc that, or a HyperDoc, excuse me, um, that I created for that unit. So it's, it's just on one lesson. And so this is something I would place in Google Classroom. Students would make a copy and then they would go ahead and do the activities that I've embedded within it and um, put their responses in a certain spot and then submit it to me in Google Classroom. So there's an engage section um, where they have to watch a video that there's a link directly to it. Um, I won't show you the video, but they would go into it. Then they'd put their response there's an explore section where they can just go ahead and look at some of these different um, topics that we would cover in the lesson on their own. And to make sure that they're doing it, they would have to go through and put their responses for me into it. They would need, this is the lessons that I would typically go over with them. And so if we are in a hybrid model, this is something they could do at home, all of these so far. Um, They'd answer a few questions on the notes for me after they finished it. This is an activity where they could apply their learning. Um, their response would go there. They would share it out. I would use Flipgrid for them to share a question that they've come up with from the observations that they did earlier. And I have a, a link to a Padlet, Padlet where they would go ahead and reflect on what they learned during this lesson. And lastly, um, what I've done is rather than wasting an entire lesson just on a study guide, I've broken that down into um, individual lessons. And so it's basically their study guide questions. I'm just not calling that anymore. They're just called review questions. And so I would teach them um, prior to this unit beginning how to go ahead and create a link and they can paste that here so I can check their responses. So um, this is, basically what a hyperdoc is and um, I'm kind of having fun with them uh, but I'm going to go back into my presentation here um, still seeing it okay perfect okay so those are assignments and once I, once again there is some links at the end of my presentation if you want to investigate on your own a little bit more um, Engagement, how can we engage these students? Because if you remember, I thought I was doing all the right things and I wasn't reaching all my kiddos. So I needed to come up with some more tactics, some best practices to create and build online engagement in my virtual space. So that's gonna include video announcements, the netiquette expectations I spoke of, online icebreakers, discussion posts, universal design for learning, and a growth mindset. So video announcements. This is um, one of my mistakes I made during distance learning. I was typing out these really long, detailed announcements and placing them in my learning management system. <clears throat> I forgot that my target audience were seventh graders, that they struggled with reading comprehension and their preferred learning style was visual. And so, they were not reading my announcements. They would zone out after just a few sentences if they even opened it to begin with. So the way to combat this is to create a video of yourself, whether you use WeVideo, Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic, create a video of yourself talking them through what they need to do for that week. So if you post on a Monday, have a brief video. And I list brief because um, they're going to zone out. Studies have shown us that after <clears throat> eight minutes at the very longest, people will zone out. I'm the same way. Maybe some of you have already zoned out of my presentation because <laughs> it's been longer than that. Um, so keep it brief. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Keep the video short like their attention spans and make a connection be you. So don't worry about performing. Don't worry about the mistakes. Um, that just makes them more real in, in their eyes. You become more real to them. 
Uh, next, Netiquette. So these are students that have grown up with technology. They've always had it, but they don't know how to use it properly. We've seen that in our classrooms. Um, so we have to teach them. Just because just like we grew up around English and we could speak it, it didn't technically mean that we knew how to use it appropriately. We still had to have lessons on grammar and spelling. So netiquette is simply just how to behave when collaborating or responding online. And there's lots of different um, rules for netiquette out there. There's little tutorial videos that you can embed within your learning management system as well. Um, but I'm just going to click on this quick because this is just this is something um, shared with me. Netiquette expectations where they're going to think before they post. They're going to use the lower and uppercase appropriately. We don't want them shouting at us. They're going to keep focused on the topic at hand. Um, focus your comments on the message, not the messenger. Avoid the me too or I agree posts. There's been, um, I've used discussion posts in the past with my students and I'll give them the prompt, I agree because or I disagree because, and I tell them they need to back their response with evidence from whatever we're discussing, if it's an article or something else. They should keep their replies brief. They should avoid using foul language or insults. They should not create a new thread, so they have to stay on topic. Um, discussion posts need to stay pure, kind of goes along with everything else um, listed here, and they need to check back frequently. I don't necessarily, with seventh graders, have them post on different days. I'll just typically say, add your response and then reply to two people below you. That way everyone gets included. Um, but this is something that I do need to purposely go over with my students at the beginning of the school year, whether we're online or, or um, in person, just to make sure they understand what I expect of them when we're doing these discussion posts. So going on back here. Um, so once I've gone over these expectations with them, the next thing that we would do is I would have them practice netiquette with an online icebreaker. This is a great way to build a sense of community, not only between the students, but with you, because I would participate in this as well. And once again, it gives them great practice using those netiquette expectations that we would have just discussed. So an online icebreaker. Um, Discussion posts. This is going to be something you're going to want to make sure to use not only to build community with the students to pro, um, keep building it and keep it going, but also we're not going to be in the classroom with them probably at times. So we need to have an opportunity to interact with the, the content and to learn from each other. So discussion posts help to do that. And if you scaffold them in a way where you can build comprehension, um, allow them to connect with the material somehow, apply what they have learned and then reflect on it. So uh, that works really well to build that into your discussion posts. And I know in um, Google Classroom, you can just easily do it as ask a question and you can also put a question into Schoology um, as well. Universal design for learning. That is basically just providing material in multiple modes. So multiple means of representation, action, and expression, and engagement on how students are interacting with the material. Um, this not only works well for students who either have it in their IEP or their 504, but for all students, um, regardless if they have a need or not. I would recommend that you use these different um, UDL practices as much as you can. And uh, there's lots of great web tools out there. I don't have a, a, a list because there is so many, but what I would recommend doing is there is a website called Common Sense Education. Some of you may already be familiar with it. I have a link later in my presentation, but there's a really great um, 
tool called EdTech Reviews. And so if I am look, looking for a specific tool, for instance, on just formative assessment, um, I can go in there and, and find um, their top top tools list of formative assessments, or if I'm looking for something um, for a special need of a student like um, text to speech or speech to text, I can go ahead and use that common sense education website to help with that. And so I would re highly recommend it. It's now my go to as far as looking for web tools because it can be overwhelming. Growth mindset. So that is something to keep in mind as you are working in these virtual spaces. If we're if we want to be building community um, and just that relationship with our students, um, a lot of you've probably found that we're not working synchronously with these students. Everything is asynchronous. They have their own timeline and when they can have internet to use and get their work done. So penalties for late work, I would not recommend it. In fact, that is the best practice is not to penalize students for turning things in after your assigned due date. You should have due dates, but um, not penalizing them for it. And um, so that is just a growth mindset tip. Um, and also there is a thing called the Addy model. Um, because our virtual spaces are never going to be perfect and we have to work on always continually improving them. And so ADDIE stands for Analyze, Design, Development, Implementation, and Evaluation. And so um, this is just a link, again, to um, just an infographic on the model. So um, you're gonna wanna subject your class, your learning management system that you've built um, to this, to this five phase approach, um, just because that is showing a growth mindset as well as we build those out. So let me get back in here. Um, I probably talked faster than I thought I was going to. So I just want to conclude with this. I came across this article by a man, I believe the last name was Tom umbrella and he during the midst, midst of distance learning spoke about revisiting your teaching philosophy and I did that and because as we are working online we the way we wanted to teach we can do that online that's the point of this and so I had to actually look back at my teaching philosophy that I wrote and um, I don't I can't even really tell you what these this means anymore. But what I came up with was neoprogressional post reconism. So <laughs> that doesn't really tell you much. But when I broke that down, um, relationships matter. And so that's why you want to keep it simple be consistent and let yourself shine through so you can build these relationships and have the online icebreaker. Show them how to act appropriately online. Give them an opportunity to display that in the, in the discussion post because relationships really matter. They do to me and I would imagine for most teachers that's the case. I also believe everyone can learn. So use common sense education, find web tools that are going to assist those students that need it because everyone can learn. Once again, keep it simple. It doesn't have to be this big elaborate thing. Um, it's just gonna confuse you in the long run possibly and it will confuse the students. And um, when I did go back and visit my teaching philosophy, I had talked about LODI, which are levels of technology innovation and um, ISTE standards. Uh, because I believed then and I believe now, technology is definitely a tool, a way to enhance what we do and to engage the students to help them learn. So that is definitely um, a belief I had then and still have. So I would highly recommend you all go back and look at your own teaching philosophy and just kind of boil it down and, and see where you are and apply that this fall as we get back with the students in the classroom. 
So um, my last two slides here are just some resources that I touched upon. One I will point out, the um, ACU, the Association of College and University Educators, back in April, they put out this whole um, series of webinars because not only were secondary teachers, but also college professors were in the same boat. They All of their learning was going online. And if they hadn't taught online before, they um, needed some help. And so there's all these webinars, managing your online presence, organizing your online course, recording effective micro lectures, um, welcoming students to an online environment. That's where I pulled a lot of this information from. And I would highly, highly recommend that if you have time to go back and listen to them, you can, you know, wash dishes while you do it, fold laundry while you listen to them, just to get that information and you can use it um, this fall. And this is just my second one. If you've not, um, if you've not been introduced to Jennifer Gonzalez, she has Cult of Pedagogy, which is a, um, a site that you can look at. She has a blog, but she talks about hyperdocs and has a lot of information. Here is the website of the hyperdocs I would recommend. Um, but all of these are just great resources here and will be there for you if you need them. And with that, that is what I'd hope to share with you. So I do have more time for questions if there are any. Um, so feel free to ask. And if no one, after about five minutes or so, if no one has any other questions for me, um, you know, we're, we're basically done. So hopefully you are going to be able to walk away with at least one helpful tip to use this fall. First thing they wanted was you to copy and paste the link for the presentation on the, in the chat. Oh, yeah, I can totally do that. Um, I'll work on that Well, if there's any other questions, but I will do that for you. I will make a copy. You can watch me do it. Um, I'm going to make it anyone can view it with the link. So copy, and I will work on getting it in the chat. There you go. Anything else I can help with? Uh, Matthew asked which one was related to UDL. Universal, Universal Design for Learning. Yes, and Matthew is asking which link goes to UDL. Oh, that would be, let me get back into it. Um, I, well, I guess I just have one link right here um, at the bottom. Sorry, I'm getting feedback. The University of Arkansas Little Rock, that is um, helping with just making your um, online class um, user-friendly for all students. So I would recommend that. I would also, I don't have the CAST website on here, but that is another great resource for universal design for learning, CAST, C-A-S-T dot O-R-G, CAST dot org. Um, I would recommend that one. Um, would be my advice. Hopefully that helps, Matthew. Anything else I can help with? Go back up to the top, I guess. I just want to say thank you. This is my first time presenting. I was very, very nervous. So hopefully um, it wasn't too apparent. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining. If there's no further questions, you have about 25 to 30 minutes before the next presentation. Get a lunch break. And I hope you're enjoying the conference and have a good rest of the day. Probably went too fast, huh? <laughs>
Hey, Gina, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, so my name is Paige Larson. Hi. Um, I was a teacher at a different district. So John Larson from Ecmax, my dad. So that's kind of how I know about all this stuff. Okay. Um, I just got a different job and I'll be teaching seventh grade life science. Um, and so that, so I was just kind of looking at what kind of like universal, like learning or, or universal design do you guys do you use in your classroom? Like sure. in life science. Okay. Um, some of the things that I would recommend and some things I have used and some things I have not used yet. And I will, I will be. Um, so any way that I can, um, like I'll use Flipgrid, for instance, just mm -hmm. because for some students it's easier for them to maybe demonstrate or to verbalize an answer rather than um, writing it out. So that's yeah. Flipgrid has been a tool I've been using. Rewordify, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that is a way you can break down the expository text a little bit more into like easier for them to comprehend and understand. And so that's one that I've just come across and I'm going to be using this fall, especially with our science textbook, because every year in seventh grade, I have a lot of students who are just, they struggle with reading. They're in like extra reading classes. And so, and they really struggle with the textbook and not that we use it a lot, but even at any articles, you can use this um, extension. It's, it's more like an extension called Rewordify to help them with that. So that is something that I would recommend. As a web tool. Is it, is it a Chrome uh, extension? What was that? Is it a Chrome extension? I'm just look, like Googling it. Yeah, let me, I'm going to go to Common Sense just for a sec. Um, and I'll, I'll find it there. Yeah. Um, because maybe I'm saying it wrong. Maybe it's not an extension. I know it's a web tool and I was thinking it uh, to do, to do. Let me find it. Anyway, where are you going to be teaching? Um, I just got a new job in Prior Lake. Prior Lake. Okay. So, so is that a pretty large off. district? I yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to, okay. I just brought it up and I'm going to share my screen so you can see it. Okay. Um, Okay, so here is okay. That's what I was looking at. Yeah. Yep. Refortify.com. So um, this is one that I've just played around to it with it a little bit, but this is what one that I intend to use just to help with my struggling seventh graders. So whether it's an article, the textbook, anything that we use that requires them to read. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Um, what I could do, um, and I don't have, I, I was going to make a list. I didn't do it for this presentation, but I um, have, so I, I took a class this summer and one of our um, assignments was to do a technology blog. And so each week it was a different topic. One week it was just on formative assessment. assessment. One week it was on visual learners, auditory learners, and um, kinesthetic learners. And so I have this big I had to come up with tools that fit that description as well as the kit, the people in my class. And so I just haven't compiled all of it into one big list. But once I've done that, that's my goal to do still. I can share that with you if that helps. Yeah, sure. Um, Cause these are all ones that students have, I mean, people like me, students in the class have done research on just to have different um, web tools to use with students. Yeah. Do you guys have a plan? Um, are you guys doing a hybrid model or in Pine City or do you not know yet? I don't know yet. I don't have the official word on it. If you, I mean, I'm just going off of the map. Yeah, yeah that's all I've seen. Too. <laughs> I'm hoping to be here, but um, mm -hmm. I really don't know what, our, I mean, the last I heard from our superintendent is that the committee was going to meet and come up with their recommendations and then bring it to the school board when they meet. So 
August 24th is, I think, when we should learn here. That's getting pretty close. It is. It really is. So um, hopefully they'd let us know sooner. I mean, they'll let us know as soon as they know, but exactly they haven't done their meeting and such yet. I just, I'm also trying to figure out to a science with how to do like labs and stuff like that. That was a big struggle. I went through this yeah. spring. Um, I had, I literally had parents sending me emails telling me that they weren't doing the labs and they were just straight up refusing. And they're like, she's making us do work and I do <laughs> activities. And I was like, the science class, you're supposed to do labs. I was exactly. so excited. This is part of why I left, but <laughs> one thing that we use here, and it is a subscription, so our district pays for it, mm -hmm. but it's called explorelearning.com. Are you familiar with Explore Learning? No. And what there are is there's these different math and science gizmos that you um, have that so the students sign you create a class in Explore Learning, the students will sign in and you can um, put these gizmos for them to complete. And they're just like online manipulatives for them. So like, for instance, there's one on um, the cell cycle. So it'll take them through all the different phases of the cell cycle and they're interacting and changing different variables within it just to see um, how, and then there's questions for them to answer at the end. There's a worksheet that goes along with it. So that is something that, during distance learning, I relied upon to use those with, and there's all different ones based on, you can search it by standard for the state. Yeah. So, but it is a subscription. Um, and I, I know some companies right now, they were offering like free during distance learning. And I don't know if they're extending that to this fall, but yeah. That would be another thing to look into. And that, I mean, it was one that I used a lot to replace some of those hands-on labs. Um, Boy, but you're right. It's a, it's a hard thing. And so here's me trying to look at our first unit here. Like, okay, observations, they can go out and do nature walk observations. They can come up with a question. I can, you know, we usually have a tools and measurements lab just to get them used to learning the different scientific tools and how to use them appropriately. So, you know, if we're not in the classroom, I still see benefit to doing that. But how am I, you know, take out your you know, your Pyrex measuring cup <laughs> and, you know, describe to me what you think a meniscus is. And then, I don't know, I'm just, I'm not quite sure, but. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at too, is I just, I tried to find labs when we did distance learning that had like at home materials, but it just kind of turned into being the, the parents there just got mad because they were having to do work for their kid and they didn't yeah. want to do that. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll just give you a worksheet and a video because that's what you want to do. <laughs> but it's not science. Yeah, it's, 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 I, I haven't wrapped my head around all of it. I know there is going to be a way to do it, but mm -hmm. I'm kind of hoping maybe I don't have to think that hard yet. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I also think that we all thought it was going to be super temporary, right? We didn't foresee this being a... Well, yeah. And then don't you think like as a science teacher too, I was like, you know about biology, like it's a pandemic. It doesn't just go away. <laughs> like, I wanted it to. Exactly. Uh, a couple things that we did um, here during distance learning as well was we gave them like a case study to work on and we just kind of broke it down. So normally maybe it would take just a couple days in the classroom. It took like o over a week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we just broke it down and um, just so that was something we did. But um, but yeah, um, how would I be able to contact you once I get that list together? Um, why don't you just send it to my email? Do you want me to put it in the chat or are you going to write it down? I'll write it down. Okay. So it's L-A-R-S-5036 at Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S dot U-M-N dot E-D-U. Got it. Okay. I will go ahead and use that. So you must have graduated from University of Morris? Yeah, I graduated in 2018 and I've taught for two years.
I lost you for a second. 